title of the message this morning is Israel and the Church, the wife of the father and the bride of the son. Very, very interesting. First of all, it has to be clear that from the get going of Israel as a nation, because you understand in the book of Genesis, Israel was not yet a nation. We're, we're talking about the forefathers. We're talking about how God started working through Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. And then, of course, they all went down to Egypt. And we know that just about the time, 400 years later, when Moses is called to get them out of Egypt, it's the first time Israel is led as a nation. And from the very beginning, God never intended them to be like any other nation. That has to be clear. Israel is not just one more nation. Now, it has to also be clear that I'm not talking about them being good, great, worthy, or any of those things. Israel was designed by God not to be like the others, not because of who they are, but because of who he is. How many of you understand that? Can I see your hands? I want you to say, Israel, Israel. is special, special, not because of who they are, but because of who he is. Good. Don't worship Israel ever. Worship the God of Israel also. Always. Is Good. So now we understand that they were originally designed to be different, to stand alone. I know to stand alone sounds kind of terrible. I mean, oh, lonely. Oh, can we give you some company? No. To stand alone in a wicked world is actually a privilege. How can anyone curse that which God blessed in Numbers 23, verses 7 to 10, Balaam is actually asking. You know, one of the kings of the Gentiles, one of the kings of the, um, the king of, um, um, we, we know that Balak, the king of Moab, heard about how God of Israel is leading the people of Israel and how he's fighting for them. And the king of Moab understood that in the physical realm, there is no way he can defeat Israel. He also understood that what he's watching is very much spiritual. Therefore, we must go into the spiritual realm and attack them there. Because in the physical one, obviously, it's not working. So he's approaching a person, paying him money, and telling him, go, and don't fight them with sword or machine guns or tanks or F-16s. Just stand on the mountain and proclaim a curse over them, spiritually. By the way, the spiritual realm is not less dangerous than the physical one. That's why we are told to put our helmet and our breastplate and our sword holding it in our hands. Remember yesterday we said, what is our sword? The word. Remember that. That's your sword. You go to your airport <laughs> and you have your Bible with you and they ask you, do you have any weapon? <laughs> it's up to you what you say. In Israel, don't say I do because... But I do want you to know... That he took up his oracle and said, in Numbers 23, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east, which is where Jordan is today. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. And look what Balaam says. He's not a Jew. He's actually hired to curse the Jews. And he says, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? And watch what he says. He says, 
For from the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone. Not reckoning itself among the nations. Basically, Balaam says, I know the secret. I realize these are not just people who wants to be like all the other people. They don't even reckon themselves to be like the, the other nation. They truly are set apart. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Now that's, and you know, the king is ready <laughs> to hear the curse. He paid him handsomely. And he is sitting there watching Balaam standing. And instead of cursing, he's basically saying, there is no way I can curse them because they are blessed. Wow. So we have to understand that in, contrary to what we as Christians have in our mind. You know, we as Christians, we have in our mind that in Christ there is no Jew, no Gentile, no Greek. And, and there is no female, no male. There is no slave, no master. Which is true and it's biblical. But we must remember that that's only in Christ. Which means when we become believers... As a Jewish believer and as a Filipino believer, there is no difference. But apart from Christ, when we look at Israel and when we look at the rest of the world, Israel is separated and unique, different for a reason, and may I add, for a season. What are you talking about, Willis? Well, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Israel will not stand alone forever. But there are differences. And even the New Testament says that. When Paul in Romans 3, in verses 1 and 3, talks about that. He says, what advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Basically, Paul is saying to the church in Rome. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> He's telling that to the church in Rome. God knows how come they become so anti-Semitic nowadays. When he's telling to the people of Rome, by the way, it's a church that was consisted of Jews and Gentiles, not just, Jew, not, not just Gentiles. In fact, mostly were Jewish people there. That's why Romans is filled with Old Testament. And he's telling them, just so you know, the Jew, apart from Christ, just by standing by itself, has a great advantage. And again, that advantage is annulled when you become a believer. You understand that. But apart from Christ, you cannot, you cannot deny the fact that God is handling them in a very unique way. The fact that after 2,000 years being away from their land, they're still back and they still got back to their language and back to their culture and back to their homeland. And this is unheard of. No nation on the surface of planet Earth has ever survived what Israel did. And it's not because Israel was strong and smart and beautiful and great. It's because God is strong. God is smart. God is beautiful. God is great. And he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. It's God. And God always from the very beginning wanted the nations of the world to see who he is by ways of how he handles Israel. So there is an advantage. In Romans 9, Paul begins with, I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. By the way, Paul never wrote ever anything in such a strong way as he writes Romans 9. He says, look guys, what I'm about to tell you is not for me. <laughs> It's not for me. I'm telling you. First of all, I'm not lying. 
When did Paul start? I'm not lying. <laughs> Here. Because what he's about to say is important. And you dare not call him a liar because look, it's not him. He says, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in what? The Holy Spirit. He says, it's not me. The Holy Spirit is now speaking through me. And he says, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. You know what it means, great sorrow? You know, who was the man of sorrow? Jesus. A man of sorrows. Sorrow. That's what a believing Jew feels when he sees the unbelieving Jews still looking to establish their own righteousness. Rejecting the Messiah. Sorrow. If you are rejoicing over that, then you are not of God. You must have that sorrow. Every believer, the Holy Spirit must give you that sorrow in you. When you see an unbelieving Jew rejecting his Messiah, that's, you have to have sorrow and grief. And that grief and sorrow should not produce animosity, but the opposite, prayer. It's a continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were what? Accursed. Paul says, if there was any chance that my nation, my people could come to Christ, and that means that I should be accursed, anathema, I wish. But you know, you, you cannot believe for your brother. You cannot believe for your mother. You cannot be born again for your sister. <laughs> It's a personal thing. You can pray for them, intercede for them, have grief and sorrow and, and great intercession, but you cannot. Even Moses asked God, you know, God, can, can I pay instead of the people for, for what they did on Mount Sinai? And, and God says, no, you, Moses, that's not how it works. I'm not going to punish you for what they, they did. And the same goes here. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ, from my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelite. And look what he says. To whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the Lord, the service of God, and their promises. Over whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. And who is Christ? What is Christ? That's the one thing that the, the Jehovah Witnesses don't agree with. I, I don't even know if they have it in their Bible. And Christ, who is what? Overall, first of all, overall, the eternally blessed God. Amen. If you sit here this morning and you have a problem, and you have a problem with the deity of Jesus, then you have a problem with the word of God. That's what the word of God just said. And when you became believers, you did not replace Israel. The Bible says you have been grafted. To be added is not to replace. Romans 11, 16 to 24. For if the first fruit is holy and lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them. And with them became with them. Say with them. Amen. With them. Again. With them. Is it say instead of them? It says, with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the oil tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. But do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, how may not he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you 
also will be cut off, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into cultivated olive tree, how much more, say that, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So on this earth, as long as the moon and the sun and the stars are still there, Israel is still a separated, unique nation before God. Is that clear? Is it me or is it the word of God? It's not me. Trust me. You know what? My grandparents survived Auschwitz and they said to me once, I, we wish we were not the chosen people because we've been suffering so long. Trust me, if there is one thing the Israelis want to be is just like all the rest of the world, not be always attacked and hated and persecuted. Let us live in peace, in harmony. Let's our economy do well. Let's, let's just be part of the world, part of this global effort to bring about. I mean, think about it. Eventually, they will get there because they will, what? Allow the Antichrist to reign. And because he will lure them with a third temple, they will like him until he walks in and declares himself as God. And that's when they will flee. So on this earth, there is separation. Jeremiah 31 says, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then, say then. then. In other words, only when there is no more sun, moon, stars, only then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Now I have a question for you. Is the Bible telling us that there is going to be a day when there will be no more moon, stars, and the sun, and someone else will be the light because there's no more need for them? Yes. So this verse from Jeremiah is not just on the by ways of telling you it'll never happen, it is telling you that as long as we are in this world, it won't happen. But when God will make new heavens, and new earth, and new Jerusalem, and all is new, then guess what? In the new Jerusalem, there are no rabbis, <laughs> there are no pastors. And there are no priests or imams or anything in the new Jerusalem are only believers in Jesus Christ. And there is no Jew, nor Gentile, nor Greek, nothing. There is no more Israel and the church. There's no more Jews and Gentiles. And remember, folks, in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, we hear of an adoption. You, the Gentiles were adopted. The Bible says when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So we see something very interesting here. Only through Christ Jesus and only from the moment, the appointed time, that fullness of the time had come, only then people had a chance to be adopted. Now, you, you, you all heard about yesterday about the seed of the woman in Genesis 3, about that promise, about the first Bible prophecy ever that God gave in Genesis. It's very interesting because I don't know how many of you remember, but it was the seed of the woman, not of the man. I 
want to see all the ladies here telling me if they have seed or eggs. Hello, do we understand? Women have eggs, men have seed. That's how it works. Unless the seed will be in the woman, not through men. Hello? The Holy Spirit, Mary, Jesus is born. It's a seed of the woman, definitely not of any man. You understand that? But I do want you to know that throughout the lineage of Jesus, obviously we cannot talk about Mary, um, you know, in, by ways of, I mean, look, you may not deal with that. But one of the biggest issues for the Jewish people is how can a woman have the rights of the heritage when there is no man involved here? Do you understand that? You may not think about it today, but they were thinking about it 2,000 years ago and certainly 3,000 years ago. And I would love you to go back after this service, when you go back home and read Numbers 27. Because Numbers 27 is the key to unlock this mystery. The daughters of Selophichad. This is the only time we see how Moses concluded that actually it is possible. In Revelation 12, we know, 12, 13, now when the dragon saw that the, he had been cast to the earth, what did he persecute? The woman who gave birth to the male child. In this case, the woman is the nation of Israel who gave birth to the male child, the Messiah, who is going to be the one who is crushing the head of the serpent from Genesis 3.15. And uh, until God makes heaven, new heaven and new earth, the only way for the Jewish person to bridge the difference between a Jew and a Gentile believer is to, for the Jew to believe in Jesus. Do you understand that? I am caught in the middle. I'm one of those very few Jewish people. I'm from the tribe of Judah. I am a very, very, I belong to a very small group of people, but in Israel with about 20,000 Jewish believers. And the only way for me to move from the camp of the unsaved that are waiting for their salvation to the saved and from those who are still separated to those that are no longer part of, any, no longer require adoption and re-grafting uh, uh, into the tree. I am now a new creation. I am now having new life. That's no longer I, but it's Christ who lives in me. So now, according to Colossians 3 and Galatians 3 and Ephesians 2, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And I warn you, I warn you not to follow teachings of people that are building up the walls again. Trying to tell you that you're not good enough, that you need to do this, 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 that you need to keep the Sabbath, that you need to do this, that you need to... You, listen to me. They are not tearing down the walls, they are building up the walls. Because they are what I call the Jesus plus movement. Jesus... Plus, you have to do this, 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 and this. Listen, Paul had them. Everywhere he went, he preached Jesus. When he left, the Judaizers came and told them, you have to be circumcised. Now, it's one thing to tell an eight days old that he has to be circumcised. It's another thing to tell a 38-year-old male that you have to be circumcised. All the joy of the Lord went away. <laughs> he 
I'm so happy. The joy of the salvation. Yeah, you have to be so good. Oh, Lord. Really? Mm. Mm. Let's go. That's not from God. You know, by the way, that this is the reason why the church met for the first time in history, the church council. This reason. Acts chapter 15. Go back home and see. Why it's not good to drink Dinoguan. Dinoguan. Do you know Dino? How do you say Dino? Dinoguan. You see? I know what I'm talking about. No blood, ladies and gentlemen. That's not for us. So now allow me to deal with Israel as the wife of Jehovah. First of all, there is a marriage deed between God and Israel. There is a marriage deed and the Bible is describing that in Deuteronomy and in Ezekiel. And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Chorev, and the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us and those who are here today, of, uh, and all of us who are alive. There is a covenant. And then he moves on and says, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities in which you, which you did not build, houses full of good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which di you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. And when you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and you shall take oaths in his name and he shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. And in Ezekiel, when I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wings over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord God. God from now on, we'll start describing Israel by ways a husband describes his wife. And make no mistake, when there was a betrayal, and there was a betrayal, I'm not going to make things nice, because they were not nice. Jeremiah chapter 3 says, Then says the Lord, if a man divorces his wife, and she goes from him, and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you, you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights, and see, where have you not lain with men? By the road you have sat for them, like an Arabian in the wilderness, and you have polluted the land with with your harlotries and your wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld. And there has been a no latter rain. And you have had a harlot's forehead. And you refuse to be ashamed. You will not from this time cry to me. My father you are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to an end? Behold you have spoken and done evil things. As you were able. And in Jeremiah 3.20. Surely. As a wife, teacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. And Jeremiah 31 says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the that day that I took them by hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was what? A husband to them, says the Lord. See, I, I did not make up this whole analogy of husband and wife. God did. 
And of course, Ezekiel 16, but you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. Listen, listen, this is, I'm not going to read all of that. It depresses me. First of all, it's long. Second, it's a really bad description. We'll move to Hosea. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her. Look, God is describing Israel in such, a, in such a way. Now look, I'm standing you as a Jew from the tribe of Judah, as an Israeli, born again, spirit filled. And I'm telling you, this is part of the word of God and you cannot ignore it. There was a betrayal that God is speaking of. But the problem is that this is where Gentiles love to stop. And they don't want to go further to what really is going to happen. And by the way, the marriage deed in Isaiah 50 verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord, where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? For your iniquities you have sold yourself, and for your transgressions your mother has been put away. Listen, God hates divorce, but God is describing what happened between him and Israel because of their betrayal as a divorce? Jeremiah 3, 6 to 10. It says, the Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there play the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her uh, treacherous sister Judah saw it and then I saw that all of the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery I had put her away and giving her what a certificate of divorce watch this and yet her Treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but is pretense says, but in pretense says the Lord. And, 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 and so there was a great covenant of marriage. There was a great betrayal. There was a divorce paper. And there was also the punishment for the betrayal. And that, of course, in Ezekiel 16, in Hosea 2, and Jeremiah 3. I will, I will, of course, let you read it by yourself whenever you get a chance. These are rather long passages that are rather pass on but i want to bring you now to something that the church fails to teach because it's easy to say oh israel was once with god but they betrayed him and god replaced them with us that's what the church is saying well you probably read only half of your bible you stop where it's convenience to you but the Lord has not just stopped with that punishment. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. There is a restored marriage and blessings that come after. And it's in Isaiah 62 and in Ezekiel 16 at the end of the chapter. In Isaiah 54, in Jeremiah 31, and in Hosea chapter 2. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall the land anymore be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hefziba, which means I desire you, I want you. And your land Beula, I own it. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married for as a young man marries a virgin so shall your sons marry you and as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride so shall your God rejoice over you so shall it's a future tense God is telling Isaiah Isaiah don't only write about the bad things I want you to write about the future hope and the future things that I'm going to perform and I'm going to see and the whole world will witness and in his Ezekiel, nevertheless, after he said so many bad things, <laughs> nevertheless, 
I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish, I will establish, say that, I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. And then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and your younger sisters. For I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you. And then he says, and I will establish my covenant with you. And then you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I provide you an atonement, God says, I'm going to provide you atonement for all you have done. God says through Ezekiel, the day is coming. I'm going to provide an atonement. Kippur. Kaporet, kapara. This is what Jesus is all about. Isaiah 62, you shall no longer be termed forsaken. We already read that. We already read that in Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren, you who have been not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will, know, and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood, widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. I will gather you at the very end with a little wrath. I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And as much as I like to say that the New Testament was given to the Gentile, it's not true. The Bible says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Brit Chadasha, New Testament. The New Testament was foretold in the Old Testament. And he says, I will give it to whom? To the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And it's not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law no longer on the paper. But where? In their minds. Spiritual thing. It's no longer be the law, it's now it's the spirit. It's no longer going to be on a scroll, it's going to be on the plate of their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man to his brother saying, Know the Lord for they shall know me all from the least to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So said Hosea in chapter 2 in a long, beautiful way, 14 to 23. So we understand that Israel was portrayed in the scriptures as the bride, as, excuse me, as the wife of the father, Jehovah. And there was a great covenant. There was a great, beautiful description of the first love. There was a betrayal. There was a punishment. But then, of course, there was that which a lot of people forget. And that is the restoration of the marriage and the blessings that follow that. Now let's talk about the church. The church, the bride of Jesus. First of all, the espousal. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one uh, husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So we, we know there is a betrothal. It's the one step before marriage. It's the, you are already mine, but the celebration of the marriage is soon to come. Then there is the sanctification and preparation 
that we know that is described in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish. All of us, none of us is worthy. You all know yourself. Look, I don't know you. You know yourself. You don't know me. I know myself. And we all know how unworthy we are. Don't we? Yet, through the blood of Jesus, God is no longer looking us at us through a lens that he sees who we are in our shameful, naked ways. But now he's watching and looking at us if we indeed have the blood of Christ sprinkled on us and believe and trust in him. Through the lens, he is adding another filter to the lens, and that's the blood. And through the blood, he sees you perfect. And then comes the marriage. And the marriage is in Revelation 19, 6 to 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her he was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So you're probably asking, who are the saints? You are the saints. Uh-oh, no, no, no. I know myself. I'm not a saint. Well, yes, you are. And if you don't understand that, then no wonder why you don't agree with it. And then he said to me, right Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So God has prepared for Jesus his bride. And that's all of us. He has cleansed us and he's preparing us for the day. And when we are raptured, because this in Revelation 19, forget about it. The marriage is not happening here. <laughs> Here we're going to have the after party when we come back to earth. But the marriage is up there. And if you want to be married to Jesus as his future bride, you better be raptured and be in his presence up there. And then, of course, God says, no, it's not the end. I'm preparing for you as a good husband an eternal residence. Revelation 21 5 then he who sat on the throne said behold I make all things new and he said to me write for these words are true and faithful and Revelation 21 9 to 22 then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying come I will show you the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like the most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now that's where we took the term crystal clear. And then he says, also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and the 12, uh, 12 gates, by the way. And um, we, we can clearly, uh, I don't know where it is, 12, only Jerusalem, high walls, 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12, the 12 roads that leads to Rome. The 
tribes of is children of Israel and three gates on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates in the west now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 what apostles you see the church was built upon the foundation of those 12 apostles I'm telling you that because there's a movement that is trying to say there is a new apostolic reformation of new... No! It's those 12 and everything is built on top of them and they are right there. The foundations! When was the last time you built a house? Do you put the foundations on top or under? Do you start with the foundation or you end up with the foundation? Oh, I have a new task. I'm going to put foundations underneath. And then there's a new revelation that tells me that the foundation should be on top as well. How ungodly, unbiblical, and not even scientifically right to do. And then he says, look, all of, all of this world is after money and gold and diamonds and silver. Everybody wants to be filthy rich. And then when they're rich, they kill themselves because they're not satisfied. <laughs> and then look, it says all that which you're fighting for, look. And he measured the city and read 12,000 furlongs and its length. And then he says that it's all adorned in kinds, precious stones. The, the, the foundation was jasper and sapphire. Emeralds. We, we, we're looking at crystallite and beryl and topaz. We, we're talking about all those beautiful pearls, beautiful things. You see, you're going to walk on streets of gold. Gold is not going to be, oh, I keep it in the safe. You're walking on it to your pavement. So you can say, I'm so rich that in my future city, gold will just be pavement. Through Israel and the church, we learn about God. We see God's nature, which is his a jealous God. But he's a loving God. And he's a forgiving God. And he's the God of restoration. And I will end up with this. While I was working on this message, I was thinking about all those teachers that are teaching that God has replaced Israel and Israel is no longer God's people. It's a reformed theology that is spreading all over the world. Look, I turned down an offer to teach in front of 6,000 people in Amsterdam in a big stadium. And I turned it down because the teacher that was supposed to share the pulpit with me is a reformed teacher that teaches replacement theology. He's a very famous pastor, super famous. I'm not going to say his name right now, but I can tell you one thing. I realize that as much as it's beautiful, it could have given me wonderful pictures from uh, social media and all of that. I'm not going to be able to stand and share the pulpit with someone who believes that God is no longer the God of the restoration of Israel. And that the church has replaced Israel. And that there is no more great and unique plan for God for Israel. And I remembered while I was teaching, uh, working on this message, the amazing story of the prodigal son. And I realized, I never thought that the prodigal son is a picture of the church in Israel. But the Lord really showed me that the, that, that faithful son who is with the father is the church. The prodigal son could have been Israel that went all the way to seek for its own righteousness everywhere. And then when Israel is going to come back to the Lord, the Lord is not going to reject them. The Lord is going to embrace them. And, and, and we have to remember that the father's love to the prodigal son who returned did not take an inch from his love for the one that stayed with him. It's not like if God loves Israel, then he loves us less. There's no certain amount of love that if he gives so much, then little is left for us. Luke 15, 31, 32. And he said to him, son, 
And I'm telling you, that's what God is telling the church. You're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. The church should love Israel, pray for their salvation. And by the way, the day is coming when the feet of Jesus will stand on Mount of Olives and when the saints will come back with him, as Zechariah 12 says, and Israel will look at him whom they pierced. They'll cry and mourn, they'll repent. And as Romans 11 says, and all Israel will be saved. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your character. We thank you for who you are. We are so embarrassed to even call you Father, knowing who we are now. But we are thankful that you're not looking at us through the lens of who we are, but through the lens of who Jesus is and what Jesus did on the cross. And that shed blood, not our blood, his blood, just as the blood of the innocent lamb that the Israelites needed to put on the doorposts of their houses in order to escape the judgment. We have that precious blood of something, something and someone way better than a lamb or a goat or, or sheep or a ram. This is the blood of the precious, perfect Son of God who never ever sinned. And in that blood, we are so glad to be washed, cleansed, and be made ready for the rapture and the marriage that is awaiting us in heaven. And until then, Father, make us have that heart that Paul has for the people of Israel, that grief and sorrow that leads us to pray for them and evangelize to them and love them. Because they are loved. How can we denounce that which God never denounced? How can we curse that which God never cursed? Father, we thank you. That as the son who is with you. We can welcome the prodigal son when he will come back. And understand that he once was dead and now he's alive. He once was lost. And now he's found. We thank you that you found us. That we were lost. And we also thank you that you're going to find Israel. And they will experience a national salvation upon our return. We thank you and we bless you.